Well, thank you. Thank you, Annie, for the, for the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you for Michael Spears. It has been so helpful to, to set up this, uh, uh, lecture uh, online and thank you for everybody that is in the audience uh, today this morning Mexico this uh, evening in London I am I am really happy to be here and and honored to be able to present with you my my recent practice my practice as a as a researcher as an artist working both with sound and and other media multimedia and um, specifically I'm going to try to um, uh, concentrate in my recent project. This is a project that started in, in 2014, still going on. My projects are quite uh, expand and expanded in, in, in the timeline. And uh, I'll, I'm also very happy that at the very end, I hope I will have time for that, I'll, I'll uh, also start speaking about the new project that is coming along, like this kind of uh, overlapping curves. Um, so um, the first thing uh, I would like to share with you in terms of um, images are um, this, this photographs. This was taken in, in 2019, February, just uh, almost a year ago. Uh, and it, this is in the north part of uh, Mexico, in the state of Sinaloa, uh, in the outskirts of the city of Los Mochis. And um, this, this kind of image has been uh, driving me around with several um, creative projects right now. Um, this is a group of people, uh, mainly women. The man that we see in the picture is a police guard that is um, taking care of this group of people. And what they do is they go out from the city every Wednesday and every Sunday morning they get together in a small office and then they they get into their cars and they go out and they search they dig in the dirt and then and then they look for human remains that may, may be uh, hidden uh, someplace in the desert in Sinaloa this is a kind of a, a space that they need to deal with uh, in this specific occasion, there was some water around, they were looking those areas, but mainly when they are alone, this group of uh, nine, ten people, um, they were, uh, they are uh, within the nature, just trying to go with uh, shovels and other uh, very simple uh, instruments trying to dig. If they find one of the missing persons that they're looking for. Generally, they are their brothers, their husbands, their sons. Some some cases, there's also women missing, of course. Uh, then they call the, the police, and uh, eventually somebody will come and help them uh, exhumate the bodies that they found. So this is a group of las rastreadoras, or trackers of El Fuerte. This is the name of the, the small uh, city that is near and inside of uh, what is called Los Mochis. Uh, Los Mochis is a city where uh, there's a lot of uh, problems with uh, drug cartels. Uh, and um, what I want to use this as an introduction is because when I started working with this uh, collective in Mexico City, in the northern of Mexico, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, I realized that there was a uh, there was a need to uh, understand what is going on with civilian population in my country dealing with extreme um, violence in every single day of their lives. Because for these people to be looking for, for graves, for illegal graves, means that they first had to lost their loved one. Uh, people generally, they're at home, they're watching TV, they're just uh, coming back from work. And sometimes they even go to their houses, take them out, and disappear. This young, mainly uh, young male uh, from different cities in the in the country. This is not happening just in Los Mochis. It's happening all all around the country. Now we are counting counting more than sixty thousand people disappearing in Mexico under this kind of a, a specific uh, strategy called 
uh, force disappearance. So uh, how can you talk about this without uh, getting uh, closer to, to, the, to the persons that you want to, to understand what they're going through? So the question, my, my first question in my research was how to understand, uh, how to survive, how they cope uh, within this situation of, of violence. So um, I would like to, to present now the project that uh, I'm been working through these years that I was telling you about. It is titled This Unnecessary Force. Why? Um, this well, comes from the Latin, which are the, the words of, of virtue, but also the word of force. And uh, it speaks or it tries to speak about uh, how old the situation we're going now in my country, in Mexico, is um, mainly unnecessary. This kind of uh, extreme violence, and when I'm talking about forced disappearance, it's just one of the many factors of the violence that is being um, uh, on since uh, 20 years now. Uh, the history of, of violence in Mexico is very long, but the last 20 years has been uh, terrible for, for mainly for, for citizens, for normal citizens just like you and like me. Uh, this case of uh, norm, uh, forced disappearance is especially tragic since it's a whole generation of very, very young male uh, uh, men that are being hosted uh, illegally, maybe in, in some kind of concentration camps, maybe uh, working camps, we don't know uh, for, for sure yet, but uh, the target is, is young male from, you know, 18 years old to 30 years old. So it's a whole generation in Mexico that is uh, being uh, taken away from the family. So uh, when I started talking about um, uh, trying to understand uh, what is uh, uh, going on in Mexico? I did this this project, and um, what I'm gonna I'm gonna try to share with you is something that you can find online in case that you would like to to uh, check. Um, in this case, is um, put now. This is a project. You can see it uh, online, and here is a little bit about what it is, what is the general um, aspects of it, and then you can go and see the the four uh, um, sub projects that I'm being developing after that. And I'm going to speak a little bit about each one of them, uh, trying to explain how more or less how the practice um, is. is uh, related to each one of the themes and uh, hopefully we'll be able to um, have a better understanding and how I work with, within this uh, practices research projects that are long term and that are uh, uh, based on, on this transdisciplinary uh, part that um, allows me to work uh, in a collaboration with social scientists, with uh, engineers, designers, uh, with uh, specialists in, 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 in public policy and transitional justice and um, art in general uh, and so to speak. So we're going to talk about this and um, the first thing I would like to uh, present to you after after checking on, on these three uh, uh, general aspects is going to be uh, the video of the first of, of the first piece of them. So piece number one, the project this on its air force uh, becomes uh, the the outlet for different the playground to to experiment and to have different questions related to 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 the problem that I'm trying to to address, which is how uh, civil society, how civilians uh, engage and survive with this violence that is uh, inflicting uh, inflicted upon them uh, from illegal groups, sometimes from the state itself, sometimes from the mix of 
corruption between these groups and, and some police or military forces, how they endure day to day. So the first one that we're going to see a video in a minute is this unnecessary force number one. And this one actually speaks a little bit about the uh, archive and uh, it, it shows the archive to the public, the archive that I generally I build archives through my artwork for each one of my my different attempts to, to find an answer for this question. And in this case, this piece shows the archive to the, to the public and the public is able to actually interact with this archive. How through sounds that are hold in this kind of a um, and uh, sound devices in the shape of a caracal gun and um, in this case the archive also uh, is made by the public because in Mexico uh, through a different situation historic situation I'm not going to go there but uh, a lot of people end up recording uh, their own violent uh, situations that are in, immersed in with their cell phones, they upload that in YouTube, and then uh, there's a big, a big, a big number of recordings, video recordings, uh, hosted uh, through uh, this platform and many others. And then I took those informations from from these users, YouTube users, and put it into this installation. So what I'm going to ask now, uh, Michael, is if we could play uh, the video of uh, this unnecessary force number one. Uh, so this would be a good introduction about the whole project per se and specifically within this, this specific
Well, this is this is a short introductory uh, video for this uh, number one uh, based on necessary force. Um, it deals, as I said, mainly with this kind of a citizen uh, journalism, where people uh, get, as you as you were able to see, uh, these images, and then they put them into circulation among them. Sometimes uh, just to help them around uh, and 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 be aware, they they send messages to their family members, telling them be careful. There's a there's a shooting going on. Um, and I would like to, to say that uh, my work is either, I work in two uh, main uh, strategies. Either the work is generative itself, that we'll see in other pieces uh, later on, or uh, has to have some kind of a participation from the public. So in a way, I, I try to uh, place certain elements within the exhibition space and then uh, allowed the public to decide. Even if it's generative, I am trying now in the in the recent uh, uh, work to ask the public to to start or, or to spark the the artwork. Um, and if it's participatory, then it's even more. Uh, there's the need for more uh, um, direct uh, uh, participation into the into the work. And so uh, we saw very. Um, um, briefly some of the images that were in that video but uh, here here is at the ZKM exhibition in 2017 where we can see this was part of a conference as well where we were talking about sound and uh, we can see how people decide how to to interact with the actual actual work so in a way it's participatory in a way that the whole kind of a, I don't know if I should use the word performance, but the fact that when you arrive into the exhibition space and you find this a certain amount of uh, uh, gun-shaped sound devices all silent and then the invitation uh, or instruction indication is to turn them on, uh, then the sound per se, the sound piece in the, in the space uh, starts evolving in a different ways. Uh, you can just walk around and not uh, touch any of these devices, or you can just grab one or two, turn them all of them on. So uh, this multi-channel sound and, and multimedia um, artwork uh, develops differently depending on, on the place uh, that is uh, on exhibition. And uh, what I always do, because it's as important as the sound as the archive, is to show this, this young man was looking at the map, to show all the tracks with information of who was the user, YouTube user, uh, the URL where you can go and check and find the sound, uh, how many visits it had when the, when the uh, information was taken out and making it part of the archive, even a, a, a kind of a graphic map of the country. And there are several ways of, uh, of uh, dealing with uh, uh, displaying this artwork. This was in Mexico, in Laboratorio de Arte Alameda. Um, this this uh, ex exhibition specifically, I was not very happy with because there was this kind of a sensation that you need to uh, there's some devotion for the violence, uh, the color of the map, the way they did the whole display. Uh, I was not happy with that because I find that the work is so strong it, for the sounds itself that uh, we're talking about shootings, real shootings, real life, taking a ticket or recorded by real citizens that were there, that you don't need this kind of a extra display where it seems like we are actually uh, um, kind of paying respect to this this kind of violence and that was not the point but uh, uh, this is at the Museum of Modern Art in Mexico City where we activated the, the, the piece uh, in October 2018 and we can see how how people also grabs the the, the, sound, the, the devices turn them on look at the information related to it and um, finally um, we have here uh, some images of uh, exhibition in uh, Poland in 2019 during the biennial, the Vro biennial at the Wroclaw, uh, and this was uh, May 2019. And uh, we can see also 
uh, how the, the the size of a, of of the text. I think this is important because uh, that way uh, public the visitor will not just stay playing with the gadgets as if they were toys, but they will go and understand what at, at least be informed of what is what is uh, the the scope of the piece. This is this is the reason why I. I I, I insist so much on having a big map and 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 the size of the text. It's not just a aesthetic. It's is uh, it's medular to understand how how the piece works. And so uh, this is us for um, the piece number one. Uh, I think we can we can talk a little bit more about about it later. But um, this piece also has uh, its its um, life outside and the and the web which I think um, um, is also important to share in a way the uh, archive and to have another way of also working with uh, with, uh, with the sound and the facts. And um, in this case, this was designed by uh, Romain Ray, which is a, a, a programmer that I've been working with since 2000 and, and 15 or 16 we've been working on several projects together so when we were doing this modeling of uh, for the device this caracal uh, nine millimeter uh, gun into this uh, model for for the actual um, sculptures that are made uh, on, on 3d additive sculpture in my studio uh, I decided to also extend the piece into the into the um, net so here you can see the model as, as it is, which is a, just a very simple model. And uh, you, can, you can have access to the map also. Um, uh, you, can, you can check for info on, on, the, on the whole project. But most important, you can listen to some of them. <laughs> Ya visto que no se reúne. Creo que están en las dos casas, casi también hasta allá. Ya visto cómo. Well, for those who could uh, uh, listen attentively to this first uh, recording, I'll, I'll try to put some other ones, but there's some issue with the uh, with, um, uh, connection now. Uh, those recordings were made with a side set, the third time, uh, with a cell phone. A cell phone that was not placed on the, on the spot. Uh, maybe this person specifically was listening to, to this uh, shooting and he's talking to the other person trying to tell him to get the cover etc but um, but the amazing thing is the pristine sound of each one of them so um, in a sense when you are listening to this to this sound files you end up listening to different soundscapes of different parts of the country some of them have birds on the back some of them have cars in the back some of them you can even listen to the grandmother or so and so telling this person please take care go down put yourself underneath the, t the, the bed uh, it is amazing at the point when you go beyond the object and when you go beyond the actual uh, 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 registered moment because it's a historical moment for, for these people of course and in general for this country for this nation uh, when you go I you know your students art students and, and and we're related to sound when you go and realize how this kind of a micro soundscapes are uh, there and we can know we can have so much information of each one of them we can grab so much uh, 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 color knowledge for to sort to speak about how was the situation who is speaking what was happening i will try again to go and and, and listen to to this site <laughs> Y 
Los goles son grandes en los cabrones. Lo dejo. ¿Cómo se me pondría, eh? If we were able to listen to the details of these recordings, and you can also go online and check on them. Um, we, we heard just in the last one, this person trying to mimic him. He says something like, oh, now it's going to start again. And then uh, he started mimicking the, the, the way the, the sound of the guns are, you know, ta, 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 ta. They're all the ones just also... Uh, saying this is very, very near, we can listen to the dogs, we can listen to the background noise. I think in that sense, uh, this is the point of uh, having all these recordings made by real people about real situations, uh, real violence, real violence that is not a, a mock-up or a construction made in the studio. Um, and in that sense, what uh, I ask for the public when they are on the exhibition space is to also explore the sounds and within the exhibition space, once you turn on these this different devices, then, then you have different kind of a uh, construction of the, of the actual multi-channel uh, sound piece you know, through all these all this, uh, sculptural objects that are involved and the public as part of this kind of a uh, element of the performance, so to speak. Sometimes I use the word um, activation. Uh, that maybe activation is not too clear for 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 uh, uh, different people, but um, uh, I mean to activate, to turn on, or to turn off, which is very important in, in, in my in my current practice. So, uh, having um, uh, shared this with you, uh, I'm going to go and 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 present you some materials of uh, the number two of this uh, of this art uh, project, research art project. This is uh, this unnecessary force number two. And so going from from uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, elements, bites of uh, um, citizen journalism, I went to work with um, uh, the situation dealing with uh, young kids in the north uh, of the country, in Ciudad Juarez. Um, uh, and first I approach, I approach several of, of which are now my um, advisors and, and colleagues. Uh, I went to present this project to um, a um, um, psychologist, Paloma Castillo, that she lives in Ciudad Juarez. And I told her that I was, I had this interest on in taking uh, the images of this 
war that we're having, this horror that we're going through in Mexico, uh, to, from the eyes of the children, from children. And um, I, I introduce her, my project is, as this, you know, like this, this uh, drawing here was published as part of a book from Michoacan about the reality, how the reality of kids in Mexico and how they see their own reality. And I show her the process that I, I, I developed back then, which was taking this drawing into the 3D model. Here we can see the process of, of going through the 3D and then uh, the process of making the actual sculpture. Uh, and uh, these are other other details on how I was working with this. Um, I worked with several colors just to check on on, on patterns and and the actual material. And and this is how that final kind of a drawing end up being deconstructed and 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 taken to the to, to reality. And um, uh, when I talked to Paloma Castillo, one of the things that uh, we agreed on was that uh, I, the approach had to be different. The approach was not to to take into the uh, into the reality to 3D sculpture, additive sculpture, uh, this kind of uh, images that reinforce the loss and reinforce the the fear that they endure. Uh, during this kind of situations as we could we heard some of them uh, before through the gunshots and the shootings uh, so uh, she told me about this therapy that she's going through the, with the kids uh, where in, in this case at the what we're seeing now on, on the screen uh, she asked this this younger kids that some of them have their both their parents missing or maybe just the mother uh, to to draw uh, a monster to draw a dragon, something that is uh, very kind of a hard for them to, to, to control, to draw themselves on one side and to, to make a drawing of uh, something that they would like to, to save on the other side with a huge dragon in the middle and how they have to, what they'll have to do in order to save uh, this object of their, of their of uh, that they care for so much for, and this is a way for psychologists, as uh, some of you may know, of uh, knowing what's going on inside of a kid's mind. So in this case, what we end up doing was using these drawings that come from this therapy, and uh, to make them uh, into these three D constructions. In this case, this this little girl is saying in her drawing. Uh, I am the brave one. I am the brave one. And she wants to save her little uh, elephant. And so from there, we go and, and, and do this tree modeling a little bit more or less the same as in the previous image. And then we have also sound sound uh, elements within the, the sculpture that also the kids will be able to turn on or the public in the case that this is on exhibition in a museum. And then we have this kind of a sculptures uh, made after the drawings of the kids. So it was important for me to also address uh, the loss and the problems to verbalize the violence that is inflicted upon kids. Because we're talking about, yes, uh, uh, shootings all around. We're talking about force, uh, uh, for, for, uh, force, uh, uh, kidnapped uh, and then we're talking about the kids are left behind sometimes they end up living with their grandparents which are one of the, the trackers that we saw on the, on the pictures of the very beginning of this lecture uh, so how these kids cope when they don't have access to special therapy when they don't have the way of talking about what what how they feel and when they do not understand because even us adults, we don't understand why is this violence and why is people taking away, being taken away to be forced to become slaves in some kind of a unknown fields we don't know where. So imagine for a kid that not, not even has the, the, the tools to, to express themselves. So I thought this, this was an important uh, element within my search because remember what I'm doing it's, it's, it's not necessary. Um, I'm not necessarily doing uh, artworks per se. Uh, what I'm trying to do is 
to answer a question. Uh, this is my main goal, to answer the question of how civilians survive, endure within this extreme violence that we're living in. So this is, this is another uh, um, answer or attempt of answering this kind of questions. And so um, this is for, uh, uh, number two or this unnecessary force number two. And uh, I will go uh, to this unnecessary force number three, uh, which uh, I will say will go back to uh, the images that we saw at the very beginning. Uh, those uh, people trying to work uh, in the fields, trying to find this kind of a clandestine, uh, clandestine graves uh, are, in this case, rastreadoras. You saw some of the images of them. Um, uh, and I try to address uh, the parents, the parents that are looking for, for their sons and daughters missing. And at the beginning, I was thinking about going beyond uh, the treaty uh, elements and do some uh, uh, some photographs and 3D models after their faces, etc. But when I started the project, this number three project in 2015, uh, violence against the, these groups of civilians, these collectives, was so strong that they start being killed. This is very interesting. Uh, when citizens start being their own, uh, uh, doing their own journalism, like what we saw on number one, and they start telling everybody in the population uh, that there was a shooting in so and so streets, so don't go, or we saw that was happening this here, here and there, like doing this kind of a journalism, they start being killed. There's histories of a lot of citizens that the only thing they were doing was working for their community, reforming their community, and they were killed. Well, now, we're talking about this enforced disappearance, and we're talking about police and, 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 and governmental offices not doing anything to find these kidnap kids, kidnap young male and women in Mexico. So that's why... This is the reason, maybe I was not clear at the beginning. That is why their parents have to go and look for them on the ditches on, on, on everywhere, all around the country, because the state the government is not doing anything, not even enough, they're not doing anything. It could be one year, two years, three years, they go and ask at the office and, and they will say, well, we haven't started a search yet. So that's why parents start getting together and looking for their kids. Uh, and also, they start being killed. So when I started my project number three, and I, think, I was thinking about doing more about images and, and, and treaty and stuff like that, I realized uh, it was not safe for them. Uh, so I started, what I started doing was to work with uh, other, other, other ways of uh, presenting the, 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 the problem. Uh, I, I start going with them. Uh, I didn't, I, I may say the truth, I, I, I didn't move myself and live there. I, I'm a teacher in Mexico City, uh, I'm a professor, um, and my practice is based here. But I, I went several times to Los Mochis, uh, which is a, a one hour uh, plane uh, from plane, and, and, and then uh, I stayed there several times, like maybe three, four times, and then I started. Uh, getting closer to this collective, Las Rastreadoras. Finally, it was through Carolina Robledo, which is a uh, sociologist, that uh, I was able to, to really uh, get the door open for me to approach them in a very close way and to be able to uh, go with them through the searches. And I I'd not even had an idea what was the next project to look like, but I realized that what need, they needed to to have, in a way, was a tool to start systematizing uh, what they find in these searches that they do in the fields, and also to have a place to memorialize uh, their, their, their lost ones. Um, so I start doing this, this project, this number three. This is not a, a, a project to be exhibited, per se. We can talk about it, I can show things around it, but uh, the actual work uh, is is not for view why because 
what I did was a uh, application, a, a phone application and a visualization uh, website uh, where everything that they gather with their phones is going to this private cloud and it's something that they're going to share among themselves. This information is going to be good for them, for all the scientists working with them, uh, for them to build their own cases to eventually uh, ask for justice, maybe not now, but eventually uh, 10 years from now, who knows. But also, which was more important for me to make it this, uh, what I call a cyber cartography or the visual cartography that is also participatory, is that they're going to decide what to take a picture of, what to make a video of, what to take a sound of, what text notes will do during their searches in the fields. Um, so I'm going to show you now uh, how this looks. So this is what, what you have when you, when you arrive to this application and uh, you create your own user. This is just a, any other regular application. You create your group uh, and then uh, I'm going to go a little fast, as fast as we can with this uh, connection. Uh, this is the group of uh, research in uh, uh, social and forensic anthropology. And um, that I'm working with this, this is where Carolina Robledo is in and so you can upload your pictures uh, and that way you can you can have a scope of how the, the register goes um, I'm gonna go with um, gonna go a little bit after this um, the idea is that the, the this um, application was made specifically for uh, what um, they are uh, they're trying to, to achieve, which is uh, they need to be safely taken from one place to the other. Once they are on the spot, they start uh, uh, doing their search. Sometimes they don't even know anybody where they're going to be until they're on the spot, just to be uh, extra safe in the sense. And um, all these locks that they told me they needed, uh, I, I put them in the, the application. Like, for example, uh, if you're part of the group that you're not going to that search that specific day, uh, application will not open for you, and, and so on. So, um, uh, in this way, um, this was a test that was made on, on 2019, February, uh, when we, we launched this, this application. This is part of my own testing. So here's a real map. This is a real picture. And uh, we have uh, the way of geolocate where they're taking this this um, images here as, as part of a uh, I, I titled it Las Rastreadoras, and this is my name because, as I said, this is uh, private information. So I'm just sharing you my own my own test that I did on, on on site. And you can do video, you can do sound, you can do um, different kind of uh, uh, things. And I think in this case, what I'm going to ask uh, Michael is because we're having issues here on, on, on sliding really fast through all this, uh, what I'm going to ask Michael is if we could play uh, the um, uh, this number uh, three video that we have it there uh, as the next one, and so we can have a, a better scope. It will run smoothly from, from, from there, from London, and in the meantime, I'm going to be able to rearrange here the file so we can, we can share some of all the details, okay?
Lamentablemente los sicarios de Cherry. Y ya cabrón. se fueron a fornicar otro lado. Y pelaron el arbolito ahí porque. No, ya estaba pelado. Yo creo que aquí venían a golpear a los perros. En lo personal he vivido violencia en mi familia desde hace mucho tiempo, quizás vinculada con eh, fenómenos eh, que se escapan a eh, los esquemas cotidianos. desde hace ocho años. Desapareció el 23 de marzo del 2011. Pues mi hijo, Adrián Humberto, es rescatista, era mi mano derecha en los rescates de animales y pues era una persona muy alegre. de documentar lo que estamos haciendo, el hecho de tener una base de datos de, de donde vamos a hacer búsquedas, qué encontramos, cómo lo encontramos, para nosotros es algo que, que, que lo estamos valorando muchísimo. Sí, sí es muy importante para nosotros porque ustedes van a formar bases que, que eh, nos van a ayudar a tener eh, nosotros eh, un una base para partir y buscar y darle respuesta a esas preguntas. Well, thank you. Um... Well, this, this video let us uh, understand a little bit better what uh, the, the whole project is about. As, as you saw, uh, the 
project per se is not necessarily an artwork to be exhibited at all, but what is around the project and how artists get involved in this kind of a um, uh, social uh, real situations is, is something I, I wanted to, to share with you here in this lecture. I think um, in this case, uh, one of the issues that uh, struck me the most when I started uh, getting into the whole project of this unnecessary force when I went to several seminars and, and workshops and I talked to uh, journalists uh, that are dealing with these issues here in Mexico uh, with uh, specialists uh, in, in social sciences is that um, the, the, the sense and then when I talk to activists and people working with these groups is that the sense that they have of uh, detachment with uh, scholars this group of people, these civilians, scholars, artists, uh, and and journalists alike. Why? Because they feel like the the people, these people, some of them, just come uh, to get either the information for their thesis or their work, uh, information for their uh, um, article in the newspaper. Um, or in the case of artists, they come just to get some information of them, uh, images, things uh, that they can reproduce later on as artwork, social artwork related to them. And, and in some cases, they, generally speaking, they said uh, is that they feel that they're being used, the civilians. The civilians say, we're being used because the, the scholar will, will have his PhD later on, the artist will have exhibition later on uh, journalist will have his news maybe on the first page one day later on maybe not even you know editors sometimes they even decide who's who's going to go into the first page or second page etc and and but journalists sometimes even promise these family members that they will be part of an article and the editor just takes out some of the information from that article and when they take out names or, 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 or histories, uh, uh, maybe they're, they're, the, the journalist is feeling that he's not being uh, ethical with the, with the person that had the confidence to give the history to them. So there's this kind of a mm, uh, situation within, within the, the interactions with the civilian group. So when I start, when I started getting close to rastreadoras, I'd not even had uh, art work per se on mind. And I, I told them and it was difficult to convince them because they said, well, if, if you have something that you want to do, just do it. If you want to do pictures, if you want to do movie, if you want to do sound, just do it and go. And just because you take their time, they don't have time. They don't have lives. They, they have to quit their jobs. They have to get to take care of the, of the, of the grandchildren. They have, they have to take care sometimes with the family members that are left behind. And, uh, and then they need to search because that's the only drive they have. And so, uh, it was, it was uh, for me. It was also a very uh, learn uh, learning process of stepping down, slowing down, and uh, listening to them to the whole process that they're going through, and try to understand what was better for for them in terms of uh, what they needed. And that's how I, I came up with this application. I did an application sim similar to this before. It's called Sinsonte. I did it for, for young kids in, in the south of uh, San Antonio in Texas. And that way we were thinking about how kids were be able to go to the uh, outside of their houses, walk around, look around, uh, pay attention to nature. Uh, that 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 piece still on, as you can see it is uh, on 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 the web. And uh, from there on, I started talking to some journalists, and they told me, especially uh, Daniela Rea, she told me that it would be very important for 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 some of these women to have a tool like this. And that's how it started the process of approaching, learning. And, and understanding the, the limits and the scope of my of my uh, my my own presence as a as an artist and researcher within within this 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 community and that's how it came out as as, as you saw it um, 
uh, later on, I got an invitation from Wack, from uh, Quauhtémoc Medina, to to uh, present a piece uh, at the museum, uh, uh, Contemporary Museum, University uh, Contemporary Museum in Mexico City, Wack, and so. Uh, I told them that I was working in this project, but uh, this project was not for exhibition. So I started thinking about it, and when I went on February, uh, that we saw the, uh, the, the, the footages from then, February 2019, I, um, I also made the recordings of the whole thing. I documented everything with uh, biannual uh, microphones, with different kind of uh, microphones, etc. Uh, Josue uh, Martinez Alcantara and Fernando Gonzalez Buenrostro were my assistants there. Uh, uh, they are my former students at the University Autónoma Metropolitana, where I, I, I work. And um, uh, we end up, I end up proposing a multi channel sound piece, uh, which is uh, uh, this number four, this on a surf force number four. This piece is taken from the universe, the sound universe of rastreadoras, and is taking just the sound that they they perform when they are on their search, when they are tracking, when they're, they're, they're digging, when they're uh, just having this uh, time together because this community is built after this need of finding uh, uh, their, their loved ones. Uh, and so this is what I took to the museum, not uh, their private information, not the the, 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 the the application per se. So it was a way of, of building after this universe that I've been learning uh, little by little, uh, that I'm being, uh, being allowed to be part of. And um, and this is piece number four. So um, uh, what I am uh, going to show you now is um, uh, we have the video of, of piece number four. Uh, before that, maybe just uh, I will try to to get to these images very, very fast. This is, um, you saw it a little bit in the in the video, but this is the office of rastreadoras. There are two rooms, more or less the same size. This is a small group of them. Uh, they were all trying to download the application. We were there trying to, to, to make it happen. We realized that they don't have the, the, the the hardware needed for this, and the few of them that had a, a intelligent phone, they had to give up their own images in order to to accept having this on. Uh, so we're trying to solve this part by by getting some funds and and and, and getting some uh, intelligent phones for them, so they can they cannot they can use their phone, private phone for their own, and a, a phone just for the collective to be on use. So we have that image there. We can see them. They're, they're ladies, but they're not. I mean, the, a bunch of them were younger than me. Uh, uh, they're in their 30s. They're in their 40s, uh, 50s. Uh, there's, of course, some, some, some other ones that look a little bit older than that. Uh, here is not part of this collective, but there's a woman um, that I, I met that she lost her four kids by uh, forced disappearance. Four kids, two and then two, and now she doesn't have anybody. It's, it's so really draining and terrible what is going on, and there's no stop to it. This is the worst of it. There's there's no stop. This is on the on the, on the news. This is on media, and nobody is putting a stop on it. So I, I just wanted to show you this before we close this kind of chapter about piece number three. I would like to talk now about. Uh, Bis number four. Um, Bis number four. Uh, I have a, a I have a video. It's short. It, you will see some of the images of the previous video because r really it comes from that. It, this is the source, and I wanted to, for people that just see the video of Bis number four without having this kind of a long lecture to give you context. Uh, I want them. I wanted them to know what it was about. So. Um, if you see the same footage, well, it's because it's a different public for, but uh, I think it's, 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 it's a short video, it's uh, only um, three, 90, 3 minutes and 90 seconds. So uh, we'll see this video and then we'll keep on talking. Um, thank you, Michael, if you could put the video, please. Un día, 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 un día,
Fíjate que la, la, nosotros las reaccionadoras del fuerte tenemos dos palabras claves y dolorosas, dos preguntas más bien, que son ¿dónde? y ¿por qué? Y pues ser una persona muy alegre, muy bailador, muy chistoso, muy risueño, siempre feliz, con toda una vida por delante. Sí, sí es muy importante para nosotros porque ustedes van a formar bases que, que eh, nos van a ayudar a tener eh, nosotros eh, un, una base para partir y buscar y darle respuesta a esas preguntas que... And um, uh, about about this piece specifically, I have uh, two sound files that I would like to share with you. This is, these are of course stereo files. Uh, generally, uh, I'm going to show some images of a of a installation uh, later on, but I would like to to share with you the sounds. So the two uh, axes of the project in terms of how I build the sound was well. First of all, the center is is the space where these women are digging. The, the point, el punto, as they call it, the point sometimes is given by people that anonymously call them or send them messages telling them that they know where uh, 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 one of these um, uh, places is uh, probably uh, uh, places where they can find this kind of a... Uh, illegal ditches and um, so they go and, and try to, to look for that point. Of course, sometimes they tell them the point and the point could be so open, as you saw the pictures at the beginning of the, of the um, lecture, that if they said, well, you go and you're in the crossing of so-and-so, 20 minutes later you stop and that's the point. Well, uh, they can be there for eight hours looking for the point at that certain space that the people told them where to look and not to find anything. So when they start digging in a point, they actually, uh, this, is, this is the main activity. When they cannot go out and look for this, like now that we are in confinement, the whole country, these groups of people, they're, uh, they're desperate to go out and look for, for their loved ones because uh, 
uh, is, a, is a matter of, for them, is a matter of, of life uh, to, to, to end uh, this kind of a peril that they're going through. And so uh, the, the main part of the sound construction is to dig in. And after that, I build a circle of sounds, eight channel, as I said. And then uh, the, the two things that, uh, that really uh, grab my attention the most about uh, uh, going and, 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 and being near this this collective was um, the fact that uh, uh, even within the situation that they're going through they they, they build this sense of community which is uh, uh, quite abstract and, uh, uh, and quite ephemeral because when one of them finds their kid sometimes they leave the group because they already found uh, what they were looking for. Uh, in some other cases, the family put so much, pressure, much, so much pressure on them that they end up giving up because the family, the other brothers, the, the husband, whoever is left at home is, is, is feeling this lack of attention since this person is putting all her attention uh, and, and into looking for their kids, her or his attention. And um, so this kind of a really, uh, the bond that they build among themselves is very, very striking. Uh, so uh, we're going to listen to two uh, fragments. Uh, when I introduced this piece in a non-Spanish speaking country, uh, I, I tried to put uh, subtitles to it. I'm still dealing with this because for me it's very important, as you will see the images, for me it's very important the fact that this is sound and uh, the public, when they come to, to uh, exhibition space, any visuals they find, they, they give the visuals sometimes even more importance than what they have. So I don't want people to think that this piece is about texts and sounds. This piece is about sounds, but also, and you may understand me perfectly, I don't want anybody to think that this piece is about abstract sounds, like a, like a, a, like a soundscape. Uh, abstract sound from the north of Mexico with sounds of women around, maybe in the in the market, maybe laughing among themselves in the house. No, this is not a sound piece on the traditional sense. This is not a construction of sound in the traditional sense that we will we may um, at least I am trying to get away of that. That's why for me it's so important that if they say, "Bring me the shovel." But we don't understand that because it's in Spanish. Pásame la pala. Uh, it's important for me that the public knows what they're talking about because sound in this case is not related to music or to an aesthetic sound. It's about an activity. But also I wanted to withdraw or step away from a narrative that I will impose into, into the situation because then it also be a, his, a, a story of a day of the rastreadoras going from one point, point A to point B. I wanted to go beyond those two kind of a very uh, uh, structural ways of uh, presenting work. Uh, so in this case and for you, we put together uh, the sound file with subtitles so you can know what they're talking about. Uh, generally speaking, we're going to see later on the pictures of uh, uh, images of the installation. It, it doesn't work that way, but if, for the fact being, it, it will be that way. So I'll ask, uh, please, if we could uh, play uh, the first fragment of uh, this unnecessary force, number four, please. Ya si no bajaste mi palita. La mía, la plata. La consentida que dice. Sí, porque... 
Well, the, the, the piece is a, a three fragment piece. Um, it's a, also a generative one. So the idea is, you'll see pictures of it, but the idea is that the, the, the people in the, in the space will turn on the piece when that happens. Um, so now uh, I'll, I'll ask to, to put the number, number two, the segment number two of Peace on the Force, number four, please. Hay que, hay, que, hay que limpiar un pedacito. Ya, ¿Vale? para el cuerpo. Echa, no. Échale chingazo aquí. Aquí, en el puro medio. Si con algo, nosotros ya salvamos. Hay que salvar aquí, nada no, más en el medio. Sí, sí, pues, nada más un pedazo como de, de 50 por 50. Limpien y ya, ya salvamos sí. bien. Uh, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna show now the, some images of the installation that has been presented until now. Um, this was in August 2019. Uh, here's at the music in house at the uh, in Alberg in Denmark. Uh, here it was uh, this prototype. Um, I work with prototypes when I when I'm trying to show this kind of work. Uh, we we got a, a screen as you can see here where we were showing the um, uh, subtitles. Didn't work. Uh, I realized how much attention it took away. It was like it was like a piece for screen and eight speakers, and it was not the case. So all those kind of things that you know we have to think about when you're presenting the, the piece per se. Um, uh, here is in a patio at the Moac. This was a special setting that we did this February, February 2020. Um, uh, and, and we had the, the speakers on the floor and we had an iPad because, as I said, the public has to, to, to turn it on uh, in the middle and that in, on top of that kind of a little kind of a table. Uh, the place at the Moac where they was shown, uh, it was, um, let me see, it was a special a sound room that they have there in this museum in Mexico City. So this, this museum had one circle of speakers uh, habilitated for this piece and the public will come and have this kind of a special surround uh, room to hear it. And uh, uh, once that they were there, uh, they had to go into the middle of the space and uh, turn on the piece through a tablet. Uh, and so they will decide what was going to uh, play and when. And you can stop also the playing of the piece. You don't have to listen the whole thing. Uh, also, this this kind of settings, you, you know, you have to negotiate with everybody. But uh, it was like the piece was for, for, you know, like the tablet in the middle and the senator light. It was not necessarily the best, but uh, that, 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 that was that try. Uh, here you can see the tablet there and somebody trying to turn it on. And the piece is also goes with two other elements that are more um, objectual, if you want. Uh, in the patio of uh, the museum, I had uh, this kind of a two mono uh, channel uh, sound sculptures that they were playing uh, in a loop. They were playing uh, the two main elements that I found or constructed the piece around, which was the laughing, the, the way of interacting, the laughing of the women of Las Rastreadoras, and in the other one, the digging. So you have the sounds of, of digging, shovels on the ground and then you have in the, in the other in the other corner of the patio you have the sounds of the women uh, talking uh, i mean of, uh, of the women not talking necessarily like but just laughing you know like saying jokes to themselves and laughing um and then there's other element that i i included which is this kind of a sculptural uh things that are on the floor and those things are tea roads they are used by rastreadoras and some other trackers in Mexico to put a hole, I think you saw it in the video, Mirna Medina, she takes these things and when they think that there's a, a grave, they, they, they put this thing way down into the, into the ground and then they take it out. And in the very end, in the very tip of, of this tea roads, they have a hole so if, if if this road comes out, they smell it. That's why Mirna was smelling the tip of it. And uh, eventually, uh, if if there's any debris from from organic remains, uh, it will it will smell. And then they start digging. So this is the second element that I I, I present the piece with when it's possible. And this is. This is for 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 this unnecessary force number four. We have eight more minutes for our. Our, our talk and so um, uh, I would like to to close a little bit with the, with this kind of projects I'm being I'm being developing I think I talk about the generative of quality of it the participatory part of it uh, it is multimedia 
but I was trained as a musician. I was trained in a, in a radio station. Uh, my main uh, uh, source of uh, knowledge is, 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 is uh, listening and producing sounds. Uh, so in a way, all my work has this kind of a very strong input into, into sound, uh, uh, what could be known as a sound practice. Um, and also, I would like to, um, before trying to get maybe a little bit onto the new project, if there's possible, but if not, I would like to tell you that this is a, a practices research project per se. Uh, that is a, through the practice, I, I get to new knowledge. I'm trying to answer this question I told you at the beginning, how these people uh, uh, survive within this context of extreme violence that we saw it uh, uh, inflicted against kids in a way against against uh, general citizens against parents uh, of course the victims of it are the ones that are not here anymore or are hosted uh, as, as, as slaves in these kind of camps that are in Mexico and they're proof there's proof that there's camps um, the sounds of, about this specific piece is uh, is from the northern state of Sinaloa in Mexico, as you saw the map. Uh, but there's different sounds all around the country. When I presented this piece in, in this museum at Muac, uh, the, the 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 chair of the national committee to for looking for missing persons in Mexico came, and she actually Carla Quintana she said you should go to these other places. Why? Because in Coahuila, the the drug cartels they don't kill and 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 and, and bury bodies like the ones these women rastreadoras are looking for. In Coahuila and some other parts of the country, in, in Veracruz, uh, what they do is they just uh, dissolve uh, uh, the, the, the bodies into acids. And then what is the remains of that, uh, they're scattered through big areas. So people in Veracruz and people in, in Coahuila, they go with this kind of a cernidores, as they call them, which are these things that you use, you, 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 you've seen movies about, to dig for gold in the, in the outskirts. And so they put these pieces, this, this uh, um, amount of dirt, and they do this with these cernidores. Shh, 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 shh. And at the end, what may remain what is like a piece of a bone, a piece of a, a, or a piece of a nail. And from there, parents will not ever get um, their own, uh, their, their own, the body of the person they're looking for. They will get just debris that they will have to deal with it if, if they're ever recognized. So the sounds are different. The voices are different. Nowadays, uh, violence in Mexico is so hard that uh, even though I, I, I got this kind of a possibilities to work with uh, security around me and everything because it's very, very dangerous, uh, I decided not to do it. Violence has escalated enormously since this new presidency in Mexico and uh, the, the project in that sense is on hold. But I wanted to talk about the sounds, the possibility of sounds. Um, uh, and well, um, almost to finish, if we could just present 20 seconds, uh, please, uh, uh, Michael, of um, the video called Power Room. Thank you very much. If we could just leave it, if it's possible, oh, if it's possible to leave just a feed of video.
no sound and me speaking. If not, it's fine. Um, this this uh, project called Power Room, uh, the piece that you saw, the pick is uh, called War Room, but uh, the whole project, the research project that I'm starting to build up is Power Room. And um, uh, it's, it, it will go overlaps with Visa Nature Force. Visa Nature Force deals with civilians, deals with um, with uh, how uh, people endure these situations under the complacency of the state, under the gaze of the state, knowing what's going on for me for decades and not doing enough or nothing. Uh, and sometimes with the involvement of governments, specific governments, municipalities, states, etc., in Mexico. Uh, Power Room deals with with the state and the government as an entity, and in this case, is uh, deals or is going to start exploring on real time almost what is going on with the presidency that is now the the, the presidency of, of Andres Manuel López Obrador that started in in 2018. His presidency is going to be there until 2024, and uh, every day he hosts. Uh, uh, a um, conference, a press conference, as you can see, on the National Palace. Every day he has two hours on screen to talk about whatever he thinks is important. He sets the agenda of what is important and what is not. Um, and uh, my interest in this thing is like if you could see there are eight feet of video down and then two uh, upper feet that are longer. Well, the upper feet on the right, that will be what uh, in a control room in a television uh, studio is what is going to air. The eight feet underneath are the ones that you're, look, you're choosing for. So briefly speaking, what I'm going to try to do in, in this prototype and, and see how it goes is uh, invite the public to choose from a database of all the uh, conference or a press conference of this uh, person uh, to choose uh, deciding through words, dates, names, whatever, choose which time and which day they want to hear, what conference they want to put, what clip, and to be able to zoom in or out of those red majestic rooms to listen to what the politician in turn is talking about. But here I'm just concentrated on him. He invites people from his cabinet every single day to talk about different issues, as I said. He, he invites the military, of course. and. Um, it's just the beginning of it, but as soon as I start beginning in research, I start also start beginning the produ producing uh, prototypes of artwork, so I, I I can know where I'm going. I do not do research and then artwork. I do both at the same time, and both of them are modeling the final output. So um, I'm trying to be very um, punctual. It's one hour and thirty minutes, and I will be very happy to to go for the Q&A section. And um, this is this is what I, I wanted to share with all of you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. Thank you for your wonderful and, um, yeah, really thorough presentation and for giving us such an insight into your work. Um, yeah, so much. Brilliant. And thank you for keeping to time so precisely. That's much appreciated. <laughs> um, so just a reminder for our audience, um, you can ask your questions by typing them into the chat box, or you can raise your hand by using the little icon at the bottom of the screen, and um, I can enable you to talk. So perhaps whilst people are gathering their thoughts and questions, um, I will start with a, a question, um, a comment and a question. Um, yeah, it's so fascinating to hear about your work. And I guess I speak as someone who has never been to Mexico and I know very little about kind of life like as it really is in Mexico, but of course I do see the headlines um, and um, the ones that like the ones that you showed. Um, so over here in London, in Europe, we we certainly have certain images in the media of life in Mexico and I guess in other parts of South America too. Um, 
what I appreciated so much about the different kind of iterations of the project that you presented us, um, viz unnecessary force, it almost kind of was like tracing different stages of you trying to grapple with this question, which as you as you foregrounded very early on, um, how to understand how people survive this situation, which as you know, we kind of learned about through your presentation is so unrelenting and so extreme um, in terms of the, the loss of lives and the frustration, I'm sure the oblivion, as you said at one point, of not having any recourse to justice and no, no government and no police who are pursuing justice um, for the, um, the forced disappeared people. Um, I suppose one thing that was in my mind as you were presenting these different versions, um, and I was reminded of the research architecture um, base, um, agency, forensic architecture at Goldsmiths, um, and the kind of way that the work that they do sits quite uneasily with the art world in terms of um, the, the kind of documentation that they use through video and audio and the sound artist, um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, uh, the kind of forensic way that they use media and the way that it can be used in, in legal cases, for example. Um, and I was also reminded of um, Ultra Red. I don't know if you know them. They're not as not as well known as forensic architecture, but uh, for those who don't know them, they're um, a kind of political sound art collective who are um, quite rooted in community organizing, but they sometimes are taken up by the art world and invited into the art world to present certain um, projects. And one thing you mentioned um, when presenting Viz3 was, uh, which was this um, digital tool, private cloud um, tool, was this idea of scholars and journalists and artists often coming and interviewing um, these women, the people who were searching for their loved ones. And they often feel like they're kind of used because they're these people are coming and taking information or photos, stories, publicizing them, but um, often not kind of, I guess, giving anything back or there's not really a sustained engagement. Um, so I understood this kind of development as a tool, as some way of kind of not, you know, not, not taking from um, this community and instead, as you were saying, kind of empowering them, giving them something really practical, which hopefully is aiding um, yeah, their search, as you said, with the geolocation data and this um, database. So very long question, but I suppose I'm wondering what you how what your relationship is to the art world, like the institution of the art world and how you um, whether that has changed over time, whether you have had difficulties in um, realizing certain parts of the project or um, feel under pressure to, um, I guess, emphasize or de-emphasize certain elements um, depending on the context. But um, yeah, so just any comments on your kind of relationship to the art world? Thanks. Well, um... I started my practice 20 years ago. So when I started my practice, I realized I I I didn't I didn't have any interest on on getting into the commercial part of the art world uh, because of of the themes that I was I was addressing back then and still now uh, the the scale of the productions I do, which are uh, uh, large format installation multimedia installations. And uh, I, I didn't want to 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 negotiate uh, and uh, compromise my practice, trying to do formats that will be more allowed for the commercial part of the art world. So since the very beginning, I realized that was not uh, uh, not even a, an answer for for sustaining my practice. And so I'm always had. A, uh, jobs within the the academia, like either in the radio station of my uh, hometown university, or uh, now as a professor, uh, in and and to try to get a hold on, uh, of grants and other uh, 
you know, kind of a support given by institutions that uh, may allow you for some experimentation with your, within your practice. So that was since the very, very beginning. So in that sense, having said that, uh, the relationship with the art world has been like kind of a, always on the, I, I will not say on the margins, on the mar margins, but I will say that uh, it's very, uh, it's kind of an uncomfortable kind of a project to present and to be sustained from from a particular point of view. Like, for example, I got a grant from the uh, this, uh, cultural ministry in Mexico to do the project three years, to sustain three years of the project based on necessary force. But I got it after I got a, a big prize in Mexico. So I could not be not taking into the a poll of artists that were taking those those grants. Before that, I asked for this grant several times. I never got it, even for the same project. Uh, but as soon as you gain some visibility, they, it was it was uh, they had to do it in a way. I, I see it as that. As that. But uh, but that, after beyond that, you don't get any other kind of support. So. Uh, I sustain my practice through through my life as a scholar and as a scientist. Uh, this is how I sustain my practice uh, right now. I mean, we could talk about how the the, uh, the art market and the art world and how the artists are really uh, the the in this kind of a chain where the lower part and and, and the most fragile part and the ones that are not getting any kind of a, a proper um, incomes from from their work you know artists they show for free uh, in mexico and in i know in several parts of the world and even though there has been movements especially in america and some parts of europe where you're trying to professionalize i mean not to professionalize the artist world but to professionalize everybody that is taking taking a kind of an advantage of what artists do and to make them think that the artists they also they should have a, a professional fee etc cetera, etc cetera. but that discussion hasn't come to mexico it's amazing so um that's what i, I will have to say that uh, i sustain my practices as, uh, as a scientist and a scholar and eventually some grants but uh, mm -hmm. it's very complicated. And uh, I think with those two elements that I'm giving you, it's like my position related to the art world. Thank you. Thank you. That's really fascinating. Right, we've got quite a few questions coming from the chat, so I'm just going to read them out. Um, we have a question from Francesca um, who says, thank you for the fascinating talk. Um, I understand part of your work is generative. In nature can you tell us more about that and how if generative um, visual or sound um, elements I suppose have inspired your work yeah um, thank you thank you Francesca uh, thank you for being here uh, yes well since the, I think since the very beginning I've been trying to do generative artwork even when it was very difficult to do it uh, I've been trying to work with certain elements of uh, sound and, 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 and visuals and cut them to the minimum expression and then make them work randomly. Uh, and, um, and that has been going on since uh, 2001 when I, I did my, my first piece on, on those terms. Um, they call, I call them uh, modular units of sound and, and, and video image and they were uh, kind of a constructing themselves so uh, I have several pieces that I, I, I work I, I program a patch uh, I, I set the archive all the all the all the bits of sounds or images depending and then the piece it forms it together so I have a, a one piece called 2487 it's online as well and this is the names of 2,486 uh, 2, uh, names of people that died trying to cross the border and comes after a, a database. And you have this kind of a apparently random uh, kind of a playing of the sounds of this female voice saying the names. Um, uh, it, it, there's a patch behind it that I, 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 I set up with a, a colleague, Guillermo Galindo. This is a piece from 2006. Um, I also have another piece that's just only visual. 
that is called the treatise. The treatise is a database of 15,885 images taken from a research made from 2006 to 2012, that is the administration of uh, President Felipe Calderón in Mexico. And I took Im images of every one of the uh, bits of news and newspaper and two major newspapers in Mexico uh, that had an image related to the war against drugs, as they call it back then. And so at the end of this six year of uh, documentary research, I got this 15,585 images. And those images, they're for three minutes, they're manipulated. I, I manipulated them through, through image. Uh, editor and uh, each one of them is, is is running three seconds each. You can think it's a video, but it's not a video. This is going randomly too, so you will never see the same set pattern of images ever. And they're just three seconds and next and next and next, and you never end the database because it's, it's very 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 huge. And that that piece deal with um, the way media help. Uh, um, normalize violence within us. Uh, so that's another piece that I did like that. So I think in a way, as I said uh, during my, my, my lecture, I either set the, the, the elements for the audience to build their own experience of the work, like this number one, where you set up what you want to hear and how and for how long, or if you don't want to hear anything and your experience is just walking around this white uh, uh, sound devices in the shape of a caracal gone silent, or if you play with the with the device that is in front of you, and then uh, this patch or program will launch a different setting of combinations. In a way, I know author is there because author is putting elements to play, but also the author is in a way living for the piece to have different lives, different structures, different constructions every time, either through the interaction of the audience or through uh, computer and audi audience, <clears throat> sorry, interacting with the device. Thank you, Luz. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, Francesca, thanks for that. Uh, next, we have one uh, from Lara. So I'll just read this out. Thank you for sharing your incredible sensitive practice of such disturbing material. So wonderful how you have helped people. Um, so many aspects of the work and project, I think, can ask questions and speak directly to people engaged in recreational drug use. Um, extents of being complicit, however distant they may be from the source. Um, it's perhaps through this kind of questioning of that, um, which helps unpack the vast complexity of the problem, to focus individual choices, reflection, if you like, to bring change and through which answers may come. So that was kind of a question. Um, let me try and maybe clarify. So yeah, Lara's talking about, um, I suppose, um, the chains and the kind of um, the commerce of drug um use and the question of being complicit in the consumption um could you maybe clarify a bit lara um individual choices um okay no worries maybe i don't know if you can respond at all to any of that um loose well um yeah yeah uh, 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 Maybe, maybe just to say that um, uh, well, there's always trying, just, just trying to get the link between uh, who's producing the drugs, who's uh, moving the drug around, and who is, is consuming the drug. So, uh, uh, independent of that kind of a chain of events that is happening every time, and, and now even with the confinement, we know that. Uh, drug uh, cartels are trying to change the whole network of distribution because it has been kind of complicating also for them to do it and all the users are not in the streets anymore consumers you know they're indoors but um, my, my, my focus is not there 
my focus is in what is left behind within the social, within the society, within these groups. Because some of these kids that are taking away and being slaves and making work in these drug camps, um, they're being forced to do that. Now they're doing illegal activities, but they were forced at the beginning and they cannot go away. And if they want to go away, they, they're killed. And what their parents are saying is even, even if they were uh, trafficking drugs, even if they were selling drugs, even if they were buying drugs, well, put them to jail. Don't take them away. Don't disappear them. Make them go to justice. If that's the case, whatever is the case, just don't take people away, disappear it, and, 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 and put them in a, in a ditch outside of your city. This is the point. So, but, uh, it's like when I don't know uh, when some of your students are from master, uh, you know, uh, when you need to focus on your theme for your thesis. If if you go around thinking, uh, talking about everything, you will never be able to really get into the detail that a specific theme will give you. So of course the problem is huge and it's very complex and it's not just of Mexico, it's about the whole world, who's consuming, who's producing, who's distributing, how. But in this case we're talking about uh, a major problem of human rights and this, uh, the other day I was in a, another conference in, in Poland and uh, they were telling me what has to do Beckett with your work because, uh, as you know, I'm a Beckettian. <laughs> uh, and I told him, well, uh, Beckett, in a way, put words into what was a concentration camp, maybe through the work of uh, the lost ones. If you haven't read that piece of narrative, I, I suggest you do that. As there's hundreds of people inside of a tin can, a huge tin can, and they're just trying to go out and they can't. Uh, well, in Mexico, there are concentration camps too. So if I don't focus on this, I will never be able to try to find the words to, to, to get into, into, into my theme. Thank you. I think that was both a brilliant answer and also excellent advice <laughs> by um, the important, uh, the importance of, I guess, not trying to do everything in every single project and yeah, having to set a focus, which is often very hard. Um, so we have a comment from Sabrina. I'm just going to read it out. Um, don't worry, Lara. Lara's just apologizing um for the comment but no need um it was it's really important i think also just to comment half half baked thoughts or you're not even half baked just it's nice to participate um so thanks lara uh so from sabrina thanks so much luce it was a very powerful presentation i learned a lot that i hadn't realized about the situation in mexico i hadn't understood quite how extreme it is nor the political background I really found interesting the methodology in terms of how you worked with the Rastradores, how you collected your material and different methodologies and the decisions you made in its presentation. Um, yeah, so that's not a question, um, but I don't know if you want to respond to that. Um, I guess maybe we could, could we could ask how that fit in in terms of um, the different iterations of the project. I mean, I'm, I'm quite interested in that. Like, what what connects these different um, stages? Well, um, um, different iterations of the project. I don't know when I was doing this research. I mean, the research is a continuous, and and uh, our projects per se, what you can see as 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 pieces for exhibition is these multimedia installations are are uh, out, uh, like the outlets of the project. But the project, the research goes in a continuum still. So I think the important part is in this continuum continuum to to have a a, a lot of a communication with colleagues not just colleagues from your own practice, which I may say uh, um, it, it may be good or not, but uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't affect that much, uh, but colleagues from other disciplines uh, have a, uh, like, um, um, well, I will borrow this word from the commercial world, but uh, focus rooms to, to present a piece with, with different groups of people before the final prototype is, is, is out. Uh, so you can measure, you can, you can like, for example, V's number one, it was very strong 
this very strong piece. So uh, the first time I had a group of people with me in my studio and I asked them to touch the guns and to, and to uh, turn them on, it was very difficult for some of them. So I realized how it had to be something, something voluntary to touch or not the object, to listen or not to the sound. So this thing you cannot do if you just, just go and impose your artwork within the exhibition space right there. You, you really need to measure uh, because you don't want the opposite. You want really the people to be in and to think with you about the theme you're trying to address. You don't want them to go in, feel uncomfortable, and run. So all, all this, this kind of things, and also going through this, uh, as I said, continuum of, of, of listening to other voices about the scope of your work. Because you are never going to be as, as ex, uh, exper experienced as a social scientist that has been on the social sciences since he was 18 years old. You will never be that, uh, even if you take a class or whatever, uh, uh, even if you do a PhD, you will never get there into that, you know. So it is important to f uh, find uh, colleagues to, to, to build a bond with, uh, build a trust as well, and to have honest conversation about uh, the extent, the, the, the borders of your work, or if they're borderless, or, or, or if you, you know, and I think one of the uh, things I, I, I feel like I am very proud of is that I've, I've been being invited to conference of uh, social sciences to also show how can true art we can address the same things because they also think that there, there's very common that that you think that you are the only you're the only scholar and you if you're not an artist you don't know how to tackle these issues and then the so sociologist will say the same of his own of his own uh, 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 speciality, you know, and uh, I think the best of it is if we can really talk together in a transdisciplinary area, playground, and honestly give uh, give and take information and advice from all these uh, different sources of uh, scientists that are that are doing uh, uh, with some ethics and, and, and uh, their work, you know. I think that's the important part. I don't know if I answered your your question. No, that was fascinating. Sabrina says thank you. Brilliant answer to my non-question. Um, okay, well we're almost out of time but maybe I will just sneakily ask one last question and then we will wrap up afterwards. Um, so this is a question I quite often like to ask our guests um, because the series is called the Sound Arts Visiting Practitioner Lecture Series um, and I guess I should kind of preface it by saying that we work with quite an expanded definition of sound arts and um, you know especially uh, with the students we encourage them to to kind of critique and um, challenge any rigid or narrow definitions of sound art but um, I'd be curious what your um, yeah what your feelings are about the term sound art and um, I guess yeah how do you relate or identify to that term um, do you see issues with that term? Um, yeah, anything like that. <laughs> well, for me, for me, sound is a medium to to communicate and to find knowledge. And as I said before, uh, I was trained as a musician. I work in the radio station. Uh, I work with sound as a, as my primary way of uh, communicating my tool. Uh, I'm 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 very. I have a lot of interest on the processes of listening listening and naming you know the performativity of voice and its nuances and the performativity of listening and 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 how you are allowed or not or you decide or not uh to listen to the other and how all this can be political so uh say i haven't say that i i see sound as a medium uh I, I, I being ambivalent, I'm actually not too um, into the concept of sound art per se, because it's very uh, it, it narrows narrows a lot of practice. It is this is our practice is free. It goes beyond any kind of a uh, border. Uh, of course, you need to be you need to have your set of abilities. You need to be an expert. You have to have an expertise in something. 
so you know that you're very strong on something. So that's how I envision myself. I know I'm very strong for sound, uh, but I am not the the, the your your uh, classic uh, sound artist. I mean, I, I will not be, and I will not feel like one. Actually, my sounds sometimes are called like they're not uh, they're not necessarily artworks, and I have some these issues with some. Uh, colleagues here in Mexico about uh, the roughness of the objects I use for my exhibitions. I not even clean them. I just let them as they are. So uh, I don't know, maybe as a sound uh, uh, art historian will put me in, and I don't know in which box, but uh, I would rather not be just in the box of sound art. I'd rather be a, a transdisciplinary artist, multimedia artist, working with sound as, a, as one of my maybe main medium but not the only one and not the only way mm. thank you that was a really interesting answer um brilliant okay well it's been such an honor to have you Luz. thank you so much for sharing um your practice with us that was really wonderful um as i say if we were there as you were due to um visit um chris app in london you would get a very nice round of applause and in the virtual teaching realm unfortunately we just have to imagine the applause but um there we go if you could open up the chat window you can see um people thanking you and um some emojis <laughs> yeah okay well, thank, thank, thank you and so I, would much. Just, I would like just to say thank you also well to you annie that uh, has been great to be in this in this series of uh, practitioners and um uh, michael's uh medal or for this to happen i i i i, I, I I thank you him. Also Salome Vogelon and uh, John Wynne, which were my prior my prior contact for, for being here. And in, uh, I would like just to give again thanks to my, my team, uh, Romain Ray, which is a programmer and is generally speaking in everything I do digital on the web. Anna Paula Sanchez that has been my my um, right hand. Uh, my assistants, Josue Martinez Alcantara and Fernando Buenrostro, which are always in different projects with me and they are they have extreme endless patience. Um, Carolina Robledo has been my advisor for several things, uh, as well as Paloma Castillo, Jacobo Dayan, and Salvador Maldonado, because they're very, very, very I'm being able to ping pong ideas with them. And that's, that I can, uh, you know, I'm very grateful that there's people that they, they share with you, things that they takes years for them to get to. And, and I, I appreciate that. And of course, in this case, I need to thank a lot Mirna Medina from Las Rastreadoras and all the women of Rastreadoras that now they, during this confinement time, they're having really hard time to, to sustain themselves. So, uh, I appreciate um, all of them uh, under the name of Mirna because uh, I've been able to approach them in a very a private way and that would not be possible if there's not confidence and trust and uh, what can I say I'm, I'm, I'm very um, honored to be here again with your students and well I hope we'll be able to see each other one day soon uh, in person I will be very happy yeah me too well, yeah, I hope you do make it to London at some point. Thank you so much, Luz, and thanks everyone for your questions and your participation. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>